Tonight's message um, came about unexpectedly. Um, we went to a gas station, I forgot exactly where it was, but got on a conversation with a lady and it was 70 degrees at the time. It was perfect weather. I mean, the wind was barely moving. Um, it was just gorgeous outside. And this lady simply asked me if it was, she said, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? I said, yes, it's, it's amazing. And I was kind of said, I wish it would just stay this way. Because I liked it, you know, 70 degrees, wind blowing and everything. And she said, I've come accustomed to the seasons. It doesn't bother me at all. And I was kind of going back to it. And I said, well, I've kind of gotten used to this weather um, for it to change. And she said, change is good. Um, so, uh, the title of this is, There is a Season. Um, Mike this morning went over the verse that I'm going to hit on. But um, fall and winter, uh, Nana, my grandmother, uh, she's told me that fall and winter was her favorite time of the year because she only worked inside the house. There was no work really on the outside. There was no mowing, there was no nothing. It was just all the work that was inside. I grew up, I don't know if anybody here has ever butchered hogs before. Uh, I grew up every Thanksgiving, we butchered hogs. And um, that's what we did. We would, we, I was in charge of dragging them down, putting them in the scalding tank. It was the first time everybody got together and got along. It was amazing. I guess like killing something makes everybody happy. I don't know. But um, it, was, it was a really good time. I did that up until I was 20. Uh, and then granddad got sick and then we, of course, you know, Thanksgiving changed. Um, a lot of people like to hunt. When it gets colder, um, that's the first thing that people want to do. They're like, they want to get the guns out and shoot something. Uh, then there's holidays, of course, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas that you have during the fall. Then there's spring and summer. Um, people like the spring and summer for they like to work outside. They like to mow, they like to plant, they like to garden. Uh, the holidays here in the spring, just hit on a couple, St. Patrick's Day, Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day. Um, the enjoyment that people like to do, water parks, amusement parks, beaches. Um, I like it because I can grill. I like to grill outside. I don't know. I don't do very good, maybe, but <laughs> I like to grill. Uh, campfire, exercising. But one thing that remains the same through all of this, in the fall or autumn, from September to November, that's the time. Winter, December to February. Spring is March to May, and summer is June to August. Seasons change every year, but it's what you do in the seasons that make it bearable. People hunt when it's cold. People butcher. Um, people like to grill and stuff. It just passes time. What you do in the seasons help with the change. So let's go to Ecclesiastes 3.1. Ecclesiastes 3.1. Ecclesiastes 3, 1. We hit this verse this morning, but. So, 3, verse 1. It says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Now, season, I looked it up, it says that it is a predestined time. In the Hebrew, it says it's zeman. Uh, the specificity in time. So if you read Ecclesiastes 3.1, uh, and in this aspect, to everything there is a season, there is a purpose, there is a specified thing that needs to happen. And then if you feed the second part of that, there is a time to every purpose or every season under heaven. So, we cannot control the weather. Many people like for it to stay 70 degrees. It's not. It's getting, of course, it's getting colder now. We cannot slow or speed up time either. There's 24 hours in every day, 1,440 minutes in a day, 86,400 seconds in a day. 
So seasons do not change. It's every year. Time doesn't change. You get the same amount of time each day. What else is constant? God's word being truthful. That remains. So let's go to Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, 19. God's word being truth. Numbers 23, 19. In Numbers 23, 19, it reads, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good. Now, I think the issue that we have with God's word is we humanize it. Do people lie? Are they good liars or are they bad liars? Some people lie very good. Some people, you can, you can find out that they lie just very easily. What makes a good liar? Somebody believes them. That's it. That's just the basic generic thing. If you can lie good enough and have somebody believe you, you're a good liar. How hard is it to lie? Just to lie. Not very hard at all to do. But after you lie, what do you have to do? You have to remember the lie that you told, specifically, everything down to the, you know, to the very action that happened, then you have to remember the lie and not change any factors over the course of time. Of what I tell you now, a week from now, I have to tell you the exact same thing and I can't change anything. Remember who you told. Make sure that you don't tell the people that know the truth. If somebody knows better, chances are you wouldn't lie to those people. If facts arise, you try to manipulate it. So what do you have to do? You have to make another lie to cover up that lie. It takes so much effort to lie. News, for example. <coughs> what makes you rely on the news? Now, I'm not going to get political, but if you lean to one news channel and not the other, what do you think of the other news channel? They're a bunch of what? Liars. So that's how people can see one side or the other. It's like, well... I wouldn't watch Fox till they lie. Well, I wouldn't watch ABC because they lie. So it's how you see truth. Some watch one broadcaster over the other because they see the other as a liar. Some people lie to each other all the time. There are certain people that you talk to and every word that they say you question. Every single solitary word. Because they lie so much. People look at the Word of God and hear the Word of God is that never lies. Why is that so hard to understand? Well, I think it's because we spend so much time questioning. We question people. We question the news. We question politicians. We question friends. We question family. We question loved ones. We question everything. So when we look for truth, so much when truth is presented to us it's almost as if we can't believe it so let's go to john 17:17 17, 17. john 17:17 17, 17. it's a pretty simple sentence i think it holds a whole lot to it in John 17, 17, it just simply says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible goes on to say, uh, let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, for this to ring true, you have to believe God's word. Let's just read number 16 here. 
All scripture is given by inspiration. Inspiration here is just God breathed. Uh, in Greek, that's what it means. It's uh, theopneus, T-H-E-P-N-E-U-S-T-O-S. That's the Greek word, but it means God breathed. And it is probable before uh, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the doctrine in this aspect is what to believe. The reproof here found in verse 16 is what is wrong. And the correction part is how to correct the wrong. And the instruction in righteousness is how we live. The problem that we face in understanding these verses is our human nature. Our human nature that does not like being told what to do. How many people here like to be told what to do? Not too many people at all. So we are Christians wrestling with what God wants us to do and what we want to do ourselves. Now I'm not going to go over all of it, but we'll just hit on a verse. But Paul fights with this in Romans chapter 7, 14 through 25. We're just going to touch on one of the verses, Romans 7, verse 18. So Romans 7, verse 18. We're just going to hit on one verse. Romans 7, verse 18. This is Paul that's saying this. For I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. What did the Bible speak about human nature? Uh, this, I guess, is point two. I didn't really give the points, but point one is God's word being truthful. This is point two. Uh, sin itself is constant. Um, Every year. Uh, let's go to Romans 3, 10 through 12. So just back up. Romans 3, 10 through 12. In Romans 3, 10 through 12, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, if it was only mentioned here in Romans, that would be one thing. It's mentioned two other places. Let's go to Psalm 14, 1 through 3. Psalm 14, 1 through 3. Psalm 14, 1 through 3. Now these pretty much say the exact same thing, but we're just going to go over it just for, just for text. So Romans, uh, sorry, Psalm 14, 1 through 3, it says, The fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. They're all corrupt. They have gone... They have, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Let's go to Psalm 53, 1 through 3. So Psalm 53, 1 through 3. Again, it pretty much echoes the same thing. It says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity, which is just sin. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. 
And just so you know that it's not just the outward sin, let's go to Genesis 6-5. Genesis 6-5. This is shortly after he created man. So Genesis 6-5. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. That's the outward. And there, every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. And then we're going to go over Romans 3, 23. Romans 3, 23. Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The first point was that God's word is truth. So God's word simply says we are all sinful people. Every last one of us. Some people think that they can adhere to the law as a form of showing their righteousness to God. Let's just back it up just a tiny bit. Let's go to Romans 3.20. Just a little bit. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 17. So John 1, 17. John 1, 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And let's go to just finalize this real quick. Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2 and verse 16. Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith, of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The issue that we ran into is when the law was given by Moses, it was to condemn the people. It was to show that they have sinned. They turned the law into righteousness. That was the issue that they were having. They were saying that if I do the law, that gives me the righteousness that I have before God. And this is just saying that by the deeds of the law, you cannot be justified before him. Now, where does that play a part? Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away sadly people think and this is year after year every season every moment of every day there are people they're trying their best to be good enough to make it to heaven if I do this if I feed the poor if I clothe people if I do all of these things even people that observe the law, they say, if I abide by the law, I'll be fine. But you're not justified before God. He sees you as a filthy rag. If that is what you're trying to do to justify 
your righteousness before Him. Our sinful nature will always remain. So will the Word of God. This brings me to point number three. The Word of God is timeless. Now, since we're in Isaiah already, let's go to Isaiah 40, verse 8. Isaiah 40, verse 8. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That is pretty much, in essence, the changing of the seasons. Every year when it, the grass withers and the flower fades, there's nothing that will hinder or stop the word of God. Let's go to Matthew 24, 35. Matthew 24, 35. Matthew 24, verse 35. In Matthew 24, 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Why is that significant? Why would he put that? Why would he say that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall remain? Let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. Best way I know how to explain this. John 1.1. 1, 1. Before anything existed, before even heaven and earth existed, what was before everything? And in verse John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the what? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The reason why he said that if heaven and earth passed away, the Word would still be there, because the Word started there. The Word was there before anything was even formed or made. So if everything was gone, God's Word would remain since the Word was there in the beginning. So let's put these things together before I hit number four. So God's Word is truth. People are sinful by nature. God's word is timeless. So what do we do with that? Number four, you preach the word. 2 Timothy 4.2. 2 Timothy 4.2. 2 Timothy 4.2. In 2 Timothy 4.2, it says... Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Now the reprove here is to correct. Another word for correct is those that are in, ang in error in doctrine or belief. Or sorry, in, in doctrine or behavior. Sorry. Rebuke is to warn those who sin. Exhort is to encourage those in growing towards spiritual maturity. Why is that important to preach the word in, instant, in season and out of season and to do these things, reprove, rebuke, and exhort? Well, let's just read the next two verses. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from what? From the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. Now the fables here is just myths or legends. In a sense what it's saying that they will turn themselves from the God's word which is true. So they will change people and make them hear what they want to hear. Um, you know, God loves you and you know, he's going to save everybody no matter what and, you know, butterflies and kisses and everything. So, but if you preach the word, you can tell them that they're a sinner. You can tell them that we're all rotten even to our very imaginations and even our very works and our righteousness is filthy before God. It is better to hear that and be convicted of your sin and turn from it than to hear this feel-good message. 
itching ears and turning from what the Word of God actually says. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 4. Now the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, but let's just go 3 through 4. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 4. All this is going to make sense, hopefully, soon. 15, 3 through 4. Now, this is the last part of these two verses, is the, is the focus, but let's just read the whole thing. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So, he's delivering what he heard. So, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So according to the scriptures, that's the main thing. And then verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So it points back to what the scripture says. Now, why is that important? Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Why is that important? In Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's so important to be instant in season, out of season, and you preach the word, because that's where faith comes. Now, in a general term, the word is truth. Truth builds faith because it is reliable. That's it. It's the truth, and you can believe it. Jesus Christ, is point number five, remains the same. Jesus Christ remains the same. That's point five. Hebrews 13, 8. Hebrews 13 and verse 8. This is a short verse. But Hebrews 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ... The same yesterday and today and forever. Why is that so important? I think that that's one of the most important verses in all of Scripture. Why? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. I think this is one of the last few verses. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day of, with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is of one day. Why is that really important? We're going to pause there at verse 8. Because of Hebrews 13, 8, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why would, it, why would time matter? Why would a thousand years matter if he remains the same through everything? He's timeless. So then it goes to verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Why? Since he is the same throughout all generations, his words, his teachings, his nature holds true even today. Your kids, your grandkids, their kids, on down the ages, the same verses, the same truth, the same Jesus remains throughout all eternity. So, let's go back to our original text, and this is... This is going to be kind of probably my shortest sermon ever. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're not going to read all of them, but let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 2 through 8. All right, so Ecclesiastes chapter 3. All right, now... 
down through this, it explains there's times for each things predestined. Um, not going to go over all of them, but there is time designated for each. Well, actually, let's just go through them. It won't take long. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up uh, that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. So much change that you find in that. You see that there is a designated time for everything. As I said before, I don't really like change. You can rely during all of this change in time and change in seasons, God's word being reliable. When I'm in times of silence, in times that I would pick up stones or cast them, I can always turn to truth and I can read it and I can see that God is faithful. I can see that God wants me to turn to him in prayer. I can see that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I can see that he died when I was yet a sinner. I can turn to these different, different times in my life whether good or bad, I can always turn to God and can rely on it because it is truth. When I face different circumstances in my life and I veer off and I sin, I can turn to the Word of God and I can say, well, according to 1 John 1, 9, I can confess and He'll clean it up. He knows that I battle with sin sometimes because Paul did. I can turn back to Scripture and I can see that. And I can also see that man is sinful. I can see why certain people are the, not the kindest people in the world. I can see that God already said that there's wickedness in the world. I can see it and I cannot judge it because he sees that there is hope. That there is reason and there is faith and there is purpose in that, But I can see the sin nature not just on the lost person, but fellow Christians. When they veer off and if they're you know, acting rebellious, I can look at the Word of God and I can rely and see that they're just sinful and I need to rely on His grace. I can do that not just on Sundays. I can do it throughout the, my whole life. I can hand down stuff to people that I love and they can hand down because why? Because the word of God is timeless. When I face something in my teens, I turn to God. When I face somebody in my 20s or 30s or 40s or wherever old, I can always turn because it is timeless. Why is it so important that we share it, never wavering, is because we don't know what season somebody is in. We have no idea what they may be going through, and they may need the Word of God. It might be their season to be saved. We pray for our lost loved ones weekly. If we don't come to God in prayer and to, to witness to them daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, and we don't preach to people and we don't share the word of God we don't try to help people out seasons come and go but we are told that we preach not just up here but in front of our loved loved ones and never wavering always preaching since Jesus never changes each generation he is reliable you can teach it to your children, their children's children, and pass it on down the line. And we can share with them that God's word is truth. 
that man is sinful and these words will last through ages to come and we can instill within them the importance to preach the same word that we learned and that we were able to turn to God with. So changes come throughout our lives. There is purpose, a time set aside for that. But there is one thing that is holds truth. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 6.2. This is the last verse. 2 Corinthians 6.2. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and a day of salvation have I uh, secured thee. Behold, what is this? I might have destroyed that name, but I didn't mean to. But this is all right. So behold, what does it say? Now is the accepted time. Behold, now. is the day of salvation. Salvation is ongoing. Now could be tomorrow now. It could be, but when somebody hears the word of God, at that moment, they have the chance to be saved. Now is the day. It's not speaking future tense. It is saying it is in the present tense of now is the day of salvation. Many people put off salvation thinking that they have all the time in the world, but no one knows what season comes along in our life. We cannot control the weather. We cannot control or slow down time, but we can choose where we spend our eternity, and that is timeless. Never ending, either you will spend that time with God or forever separated from him. These are the things that I thank God for. I thank God for his truth, which is the word of God. His revelation of man. I don't think men would be able to write the Bible, as people think that they do, because why would man write how wicked and awful that they are? You think if they wrote something like that, that they would make men more presentable. But he said that the very imagination and the thoughts and their actions and everything is evil. So I'm thankful for his revelation of man. His timeless message that we share every Sunday, every year, uh, every moment, we can turn to the word of God at any time. Our ability to preach. I'm thankful that we're able to share the word of God with other people. And Jesus' reliable nature throughout all generations. I'm thankful that Jesus is not like me. That Sometimes is in a good mood, sometimes in a bad mood, sometimes worth being around, sometimes not worth being around. That Jesus is timeless and that his thought and his preciousness to people and his love for sinners never changes. And that helps with all of those together, helps to sustain us through our seasons of life. So for those that are watching online, um, you may not know Jesus at all. I don't know what season that you're in right now. You may be in a season of joy. You may be in a season of sad, sorrow. or I don't know where you are in your life. You might view the word of God as this fake things that, that, that somebody's told you. Um, you might not rely on the word of God at all. You might see it as this fake but what, where does that come from? Do you doubt people? If you doubt people, that you know, people let you down. But I've never known of the Word of God to ever let me down. Even sometimes that I, you know, might turn from it, might not like it. When he asks me to forgive somebody that I don't really want to forgive or wants me to confess the sins that I might be burying down deep. But God is timeless. Jesus is timeless. The word of God is timeless. And it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, that now is the accepted time for salvation. What season are you going to put off to turn to God? I pray if you listen to this message and you want to accept Christ, you don't really have to go anywhere. Just simply bow your head and say, you know what? I thought your word was just a bunch of fables. I never knew you. 
when you spent your life, it says that we're sinners. So it's not a shock if God, if you confess your sins to God because he already knows that you're wicked. So you just need to confess yourself to him and he'll turn your life around. And maybe the next season of your life, you can learn to trust in him a little bit more. But that's up to you. You can either spend the rest of your life turning away from him and let the seasons come and go, but you spend eternity without him. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Will you turn your life to him? It's up to you. Let's pray.